A lot of breaking news regarding vaccine efficacy. We're going to talk about that with the CEO from Novavax, Stanley Irk, as well as Anjali Kamlani, who is the correspondent here at Yahoo Finance. Very quickly, uh, Mr. Irk, congratulations. 89.3% efficacy in the UK. What else can you tell us? Well, it's actually, it's an interesting number. Uh, we, we did a, we were doing three efficacy trials right now, one in South Africa, one in the UK, and the third one in the US. And in the UK, that number is actually a blend. But actually, what we did was, is we, we brought in 15,000 people. And during the trial, it turns out, I don't know if you've heard of the term variants, but, but a variant came in in the UK. And so half of our people got infected by a variant, and the other half got infected by the, the original Wuhan uh, uh, virus. And, and, and we were able to break out the numbers after we wrote the press release, actually. And so it turns out, against the standard uh, prototype vaccine that, that we all know and love, uh, we had a 96% uh, uh, reduction uh, efficacy rate. And against this variant, it was 86. So it was, it was obviously exceptional with the, with the uh, Wuhan. But, but what we learned is that the variants matter. And so, so you got a bit of a decrease in vaccine efficacy with the variant. And then we, um, and then in South Africa, we we went up against uh, another variant. It's called the triple. It's tr called the triple mutation variant, which is thought to be everybody worried that it would be more resistant to vaccination. It turns out it was, and it turns out that in in the group, uh, the big part of the group, which was HIV negative group, ninety two percent of the group, uh, we got a sixty percent uh, vaccine efficacy. So it's reduced, but it still works. And, and so right. we're learning a lot about uh, what's happening with the coronavirus right now. Absolutely. And Stan, thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, looking at that, obviously, with the concerning variants, B117 out of UK, B1351 out of South Africa, and P1 out of Brazil, uh, we know that all of these are now in the U.S. What are you going to be doing in order to maybe uh, prepare for them being uh, growing uh, as strains here in the U.S.? It's not what we will be doing. It's what we are doing. Now we started. We made the we made the South African variant, and it's in our research lab, and we're we're growing it up into into this scale, and then ultimately we'll grow it up into a much larger vat. But we've made it, and uh, we're going to purify the protein and marry it up with our adjuvant, and start uh, animal studies very quickly. We hope to get into human studies uh, with the variant. And we'll look at it as a vaccine with just the variant. We'll look at the vaccine with the variant and our current vaccine and make it a bivalent vaccine, which our, which our platform allows us to do. And so we'll look at it in humans uh, starting next quarter, I think. And looking at it from the ramp up and production standpoint, obviously you have to prepare a lot. Can you tell us a little bit more about the timeline uh, for the U.S. Uh, as a clinical trial, as well as um, if you plan to partner with anyone? You know, this time last year, uh, you were you were in a much different place as a company, but definitely have had to to grow a lot. So, what are we looking at in terms of partnerships? Well, the the one thing that we need is manufacturing capacity. One year ago today, we had zero. And now today we've put together eight different large scale commercial production plants, either ones that we bought or ones we're partnering with other companies or uh, what's called contract manufacturing organizations. So we've got them in India, in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe, in the US and in Asia. And so we have now the capacity and, the, and as I referred to as the beauty of, of our platform. What, how we make our vaccine is we grow up proteins in vats. And we, and we purify them out and they form particles. And then we take an adjuvant, which is just a chemical solution. We put them in a vial, mix them and put them in a vial. That's your vaccine. Well, all we have to do with this, with these variants, they're the basically the same entity and we can make it using the same process. So it's not the months of scale up learning that we have to do. We can just, instead of making a Wuhan batch, we can make a, UK variant batch or South African variant batch, we very quickly can switch in. We've, we've heard from the FDA that they're not going to require efficacy. They're probably not going to require efficacy trials, but simply a, you know, a 400 person, uh, what, what's called an immunogenicity trial, just to show that the immune response you get to, to the new strain is the same level that you get to the original strain. 
and then yeah. uh, put it into yeah. humans. Stan, what do we know about pricing? Have you considered that? Where do those talks stand? I it's um, we've only got the data yesterday, and so we haven't we haven't figured out a, a uh, pricing strategy, and, and uh, I don't know. I, I just don't know the answer to your question. I I, I know where you've heard what the pricing uh, of the pandemic uh, COVID vaccines are, and and, uh, and if you have to put a second antigen in, it may be a little bit more. But but so I don't know. What benefits might there be to perhaps approaching the FDA for an emergency use authorization based upon the UK data? Well, that's exactly what we're planning on doing. So because we, with the timing, which you would be interested in, is we have to finish the UK trial. What we reported on was uh, an interim analysis, and it's going to take probably two or three more weeks to finish the study and get all the cases that we need before we file with the MHRA, which is the uh, UK FDA. And, um, and that package, that same package we will give to EMA, which is the European equivalent to Canada, et cetera. So we're gonna file on multiple uh, regulatory uh, 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 agencies and including we'll take the same package, we'll take the same package to the FDA because we'll have that package much faster than we'll have from the phase three trial we're doing right now. Phase three trial we're doing in the US, it's 30,000 people, 16 or 17,000 have been recruited as of today. We'll finish the 30,000 by the first or second week of second week of February. Then you have to collect cases, which takes six weeks. So, so you're looking at way off in March uh, to get the US uh, trial uh, closed. And, and then a analyze the data. And, and we will be filing with the MHRA uh, before then. So that, and, and I think the FDA is, uh, will be open to this. We've, I think it would have been, I have lots more confidence given the great data we have from this, from this study. And there's gonna be a lot of enthusiasm to get this uh, uh, through the regulatory process. This is a great vaccine. Dan, looking at it from that perspective, I'm so glad you brought up the U.S. trial because I would love to know a little bit more about the timeline for that, and if you could, if you could still end up rolling out the vaccine before it's complete, and what that does then for the trial. Well, we we would not be able to roll out the vaccine before the because the trial will be over. We'll, we'll, we'll be over by March. We will not be able to get a vaccine approved and rolled out uh, before then. So. Um, so I, I know what you're saying, but 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 we'll be able to get the data from the trial. And, and I anticipate uh, an ideal situation would be is if we use the UK data to get FDA approval while we're going through the process of FDA approval, we finish the the U.S. trial, and while we're inter while we're rolling out product in the U.S., we we uh, now remember there's an EUA and then there's a BLA, a bio you know a formal license. We'll use the U.S. data. Uh, it's not for not. We'll use the U.S. data for the BLA. Stan, you mentioned earlier the eight large-scale production plans that you have underway. I mean, this is extraordinary because Novavax has never before brought a vaccine to the market. What do you foresee as being some of the biggest logistical challenges that you think need to be addressed, at least in the short term? Well, we've let me. I've been accused of never having brought a, uh, a product to market before little old Novavax. It turns out, so I'll just I'll, I'll make one comment to that. We have a, an incredible staff of now 700 people, and many of those 700 people have brought many products to market. So it's not the company, it's the people that bring it to market. So uh, that point aside, it is incredibly complex, but we've, we've been through the complexity for the last year. I don't think anybody's ever tried to get eight plants up and running uh, at the same time for a biologic, and it's unprecedented, but we've done it. All eight, seven of the eight plants right now are producing uh, at commercial scale, G, what's called GMP material. Uh, good, that's material that's that's suitable for human use. And and so January, we're, we're, we're making and stockpiling that material, uh, waiting for licensure. 
And Sam, to follow up on that, uh, with the rollout, of course, we've seen how how troublesome that is. Um, right now, with the partnership with the U.S. government, are you already working on ensuring that that last mile doesn't break down when your vaccine comes to the market? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The last mile is not mine, though. I, I have to get it to uh, I have to get it to HHS or CDC distribution centers, and my job is to get a vaccine approved, made, packaged and shipped to these distribution centers.